Thank you, thank you very much. I'm Howard Weiss. Uh, as you can see from the slide, I'm an adjunct associate professor of neurology at Johns Hopkins. Now, Hopkins has several categories of positions. They have their voluntary faculty, people like myself who aren't actually employed by the university do some teaching. They used to actually call us the part-time faculty. And a couple of years ago, they changed the name from part-time to adjunct. Uh, so I'm an adjunct associate professor, but I never actually knew what the word adjunct meant. So I looked it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, and uh, it actually means unnecessary. <laughs> so I guess that, that tells you my role at Hopkins, uh, but I still enjoy teaching. So today, I'm going to review some of the myths and misunderstandings about Parkinson's. And there's a lot of concepts and ideas that have been perpetuated over the years that aren't, that aren't exactly accurate. And I'm gonna to try to straighten some of these out. And at the same time, review the current ideas about the treatment, the management, the prognosis. So hopefully by the end of this talk, uh, you'll have a better understanding of Parkinson's disease. And but some of you might need a strong cup of coffee or maybe even take a nap, but hopefully I'll keep your interest for the next 45 minutes or so. So myth number one, there is a Parkinson's disease. Well, you've heard the old saying, if you've seen one, you've seen them all. We all know that, right? No, because if you've seen one person with Parkinson's disease, you've seen one Parkinson's disease person because the problems and the symptoms in patients with Parkinson's disease aren't all the same. And there's no two cases exactly alike. And this little montage so shows some of the celebrities that have been affected with Parkinson's over the years, and it could affect anyone, male, female, a little more prevalent in men than women. And it's a worldwide condition. It doesn't just occur in any particular country. It occurs in China, Japan, Africa, Asia, Europe, but no two cases are alike. And the reason I say that there really isn't a Parkinson's disease is because there is a wide spectrum of potential symptoms. We diagnose Parkinson's disease. In fact, I say that we, instead of calling it Parkinson's disease, it actually should be, we should really think of it as the Parkinson's diseases because the cases are all different and, the, and people develop Parkinson's diseases for different reasons. But there's a wide spectrum of different motor symptoms. And when we say motor symptoms, we're talking about symptoms that affect movement. And you're all familiar with these things, stiffness, slowness of movement, tremors, maybe instability. And there's also a spectrum of potential non-motor symptoms, but it's quite variable from case to case. And this is the point. Every person is unique. And when you go online or read things about Parkinson's disease, you have to realize that much of what you're going to read is not going to apply to your personal case. Nobody is average. There's no such thing as the average case. It's a spectrum. Nobody gets every symptom. And thus, it's very difficult sometimes to prognosticate. So every person's experience with Parkinson's disease is different, but one thing is true. Pessimists and optimists develop the same illnesses, but lead very different lives. And an important element of doing well with Parkinson's disease is maintaining good mental health. Now, over the years of my practice, I've had two types of patients. I would ask a patient, for example, uh, if you stand up, you sometimes get dizzy or lightheaded, and I would expect them to answer yes or no. But some patients would respond, not yet. Well, as I mentioned earlier, everybody doesn't get every symptom, and it's Clear. The one thing I've learned is life is not made better if you become a not yetter. So please don't, don't think in that framework. Well, myth number two. Well, we have, we have such access to information these days that never occurred before, particularly the internet, but also publications. So myth number two, the internet is an excellent and very reliable source of information about Parkinson's disease. And the answer is maybe yes, maybe no, not necessarily. And here's the dilemma. If you don't read about Parkinson's disease, if you don't go online, you run the risk of being uninformed. 
But on the other hand, if you go online and read anything that you possibly can get a hold of, you also run the risk of becoming misinformed. I always tell people, you know, if you walked into a room and saw a bottle, would you drink from an unmarked bottle? Of course not. Well, when you read things online, often you don't know the source of the information. What is their expertise? What's their motivation? And yet people often will believe what they read online, even though it might be coming from an unreliable source. So here's the dilemma. Google will give you the haystack, but how do you find the needle? Because every case is different. And sadly, over the years, many of my patients have become victims of TMI, too much information, information that is not accurate, or information that is irrelevant to their personal case. So where do we go for information? Well, certainly Maryland Association for Parkinson's Support tries to provide reliable information. And there are several national organizations whose websites I think are quite trustworthy. The National Parkinson Foundation, Michael J. Fox, and the research organizations, the National Neurology Organization that does educational seminars on Parkinson's is called the Movement Disorders Society. They have a wonderful website that's very accessible with information for patients called movementdisorders.org. And then the American Parkinson's Disease Association has another excellent website. Now, there are many, many, many books about Parkinson's disease. And there are many books that are very good. But over the years, I've come across many books that have been promoted for patients that are really um, aren't particularly reliable. The one book I would recommend if you feel like you would like to have a nice reference book at home about Parkinson's that's reliable, that's uh, written by a legitimate expert who's not trying to sell some product or some um, outlandish uh, type of approach to the disease, is a fellow named Dr. Eric Alskog from the Mayo Clinic. He wrote a book entitled The New Parkinson's Disease Treatment Book. This is not a book that I would recommend that you read from cover to cover. It's not meant to be read. It's more of a reference book. It's probably about 600 pages long, so <laughs> it'll take quite a while to read this. But he really addresses a variety of issues. And if you're having trouble, let's say, with uh, not sleeping well or even a problem, let's say, with constipation, he covers every aspect of Parkinson's disease in a very reliable and sober fashion. So if you need, if you'd like to have a book at home, I highly recommend this would be a nice thing to add to your library. Now, myth number three, there is no single treatment that should be recommended for every Parkinson's disease patient. And that's not true because every Parkinson's disease patients, every person with Parkinson's disease should be exercising. And I know many of you have not been in that habit of exercising. So here's one of my patients, uh, gentleman in his early 70s, had Parkinson's for a couple of years, came to see me. He never really exercised. He's a little overweight. Uh, if exercise was going to be good for this man, I told him, please join a class, get in a class. And I gave him some recommendations from MAPS and some of the other organizations. And he came back a few months later and says, Dr. Weiss, for an hour, I turned and I twisted and I bent and I stretched and I broke into a sweat. Well, I was so thrilled to hear that. But then he said, by the time I got in my leotard, the exercise class was over. Well, obviously, you don't have to get into a leotard and to get into an exercise class. Exercise is something that everyone can do, but there's no one program that's right for everyone. It has to be individualized. It has to be something you can tolerate. And, there, and we have all sorts of choices. And this is what the Maryland Association for Parkinson's Support uh, does quite well, providing exercise classes. And there's something for everyone. And there's much you could do on your own, walking and swimming and, and, and even have an exercise bicycle at home or joining a class, dancing, boxing, yoga, tai chi. There's something for everyone. And there's no reason not to be doing it. So I strongly recommend that you participate in some of the Maryland Association for Parkinson Support Programs. And there's another wonderful organization in the DC area, the Parkinson Foundation of the National Capital Area. They also sponsor some good programs. There are programs for everyone. But here's the dilemma. It's easy to take pills, but 
exercising regularly takes effort. And this is sometimes where we fall short. And I always remind patients that effort, it's true, effort in life isn't always rewarded. But lack of effort is never rewarded. And I think if you want to do well in the long run with your Parkinson's disease, regular exercise should be an important part of your program. Well, myth number three, or number four, there are no safe and effective medications for controlling motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. That is absolutely, positively false. There are some wonderful medicines for treating the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And this goes all the way back to the 1960s when it was discovered that there was a group of nerve cells in the brain that were slowly deteriorating, slowly degenerating, and that these certain nerve cells were producing a chemical called dopamine. And dopamine was very important in helping the brain regulate complex sequences of movements. So when the dopamine levels weren't right, people's movements would slow down and become inefficient. And this was a major breakthrough. And a treatment that helped this dramatically was discovered in the late 1960s, carbidopa levodopa. And it was in the, I was actually a medical student at that time, and I saw some of the first patients who ever received this medication. And this is frankly what got me interested in becoming a neurologist and in treating Parkinson's disease, because patients who had Parkinson's disease found that they were moving better, this benefit lasted throughout the years. And even today, now we're five decades later, this is still the safest and most effective medication. So let me just quickly refresh your memories. How does this medicine work? Well, the brain cells that aren't functioning would normally produce dopamine. Dopamine levels in the brain drop. And by giving this levodopa, levodopa is converted to dopamine. Now, why don't we just give dopamine? Well, dopamine doesn't enter the brain. If you took it by mouth, it wouldn't get from the bloodstream into the brain. In effect, it'd be very nauseating. So, Levodopa, which is the chemical that's converted to dopamine in the brain, gets into the bloodstream, gets into the brain, but a lot of it is converted to dopamine in the gut. So we block the conversion of this levodopa or L-dopa in the bloodstream with this second drug called carbidopa, because you don't want dopamine in the bloodstream, you want it in the brain. But the carbidopa doesn't get into the brain. So this levodopa gets into the brain and the Symptoms improve. Now, those of you who've had Parkinson's for a well, while, I'm sure almost every one of you are on some form of carbidopa, levodopa. There are many, many different doses available. There's many different dosage forms. And once again, no two patients are right. One size does not fit all. The doses of carbidopa need to be titrated individually according to your symptoms. So when the doctor uh, is treating you. People have to take this in divided doses. It's usually best taken on an empty stomach uh, without food to get the best absorption. And dose is determined by monitoring your symptoms. So there's no one dose that's correct for everyone. And in many cases, of course, particularly after a number of years, hyperdopa levodopa is still the mainstay of treatment. It is the most effective, safest, medication for Parkinson's disease, but often to get the optimal effect, we have to combine this with some other medications. And um, if possible, we try to use the carbidopa levodopa without other medicines, but often other medicines can be quite helpful. And there's a whole list, I'm sure some of you are on one or more of these additional medications that all have a role for many patients. And once again, it's very individual. You don't need to be on all of these. And, and most patients, frankly, do quite well just with the plain carbidopa levodopa, but it's nice to have other options. And there are many options. And just in the last couple of years, there have been a couple of new medications added to our list. But the whole goal, and this is a slide that I show my fellow physicians, the do's and don'ts of treating Parkinson's disease. Do not over-medicate patients. Because as with anything else, you want to find the dose that works, but giving too much can cause side effects. So you find the dose that works, you don't have to give more than that, and everybody's a little different. You have to be very careful because over-medication can 
cause significant side effects. But on the same token, often, unfortunately, there's a tendency of doctors to under-medicate patients. You have to give the right dose, not too much, not too little. Because if you're under-medicated, you might have more symptoms and that could be, we don't need more disability. Once again, it's very individual, it has to be titrated. So what's the goal when I'm a, as a physician treating Parkinson's? Well, it'd be wonderful if I could completely eliminate every symptom 100% of the time. That's nice, but often it's not possible. Sort of like diabetes. You know, when, some, when a doctor is treating somebody with diabetes, you're probably not gonna make the sugar perfect 100% of the time. The goal is to make it as good as you can most of the time. And in Parkinson's, of course, realistically, we are able to keep people functioning in the mainstream of life for many, many, many years. This medicine has really revolutionized how we treat Parkinson's. But the dopamine picture is not the whole story. So myth number five, lack of dopamine is the cause of the Parkinson's diseases. And actually, that's not true at all. Lack of dopamine occurs, but it's actually not the cause. It's just one of the things that happens in Parkinson's. So let me go back because I always find that patients with Parkinson's, maybe they read something about Lewy bodies and, and, and they don't, I find a lot of my patients don't know what we're actually talking about. Um, and so let me try to explain this. You know, Parkinson, Dr. Parkinson's wrote his book describing the clinical symptoms of the disease that carries his name back in the early 1800s. And nobody had an idea of what was going on uh, in the brain causing these symptoms until the early 20th century when, at, when, when patients had died and they did autopsies and they looked under the, the midbrain often normally has these nerve cells that have pigmented. In fact, it's called the substantia nigra, the dark substance. With Parkinson's disease patients, these pigmented neurons were quite diminished. And when they looked under the microscope at these pigmented neurons, they had inside the cell this little, with a stain, they had this little glob that normally is not present. It's that little glob of proteins that was first described by a fellow named Dr. His name is after Dr. Louis, as I said, pronounced Livy. And this was called the Louis body. This is what they saw in the cells of persons with Parkinson's disease. And it wasn't until the 1960s that they realized that these were the cells that were producing dopamine. And the dopamine was being released into the brain in this area called the striatum. So that's the whole connection, that the Lewy bodies were these little abnormal globs of protein that were accumulating in the nerve cells. Um, the thought is that this, this was somehow damaging the nerve cells, and that was sort of turning off the dopamine production and killing the cells. So there's no question that the loss of the nerve cells that normally would produce dopamine results in impaired motor control. That's an important part of Parkinson's disease, but it is not the only abnormality in Parkinson's disease, and it's not the cause of Parkinson's disease. The cause of Parkinson's disease is, well, what's making these nerve cells degenerate? That's the cause. The effect is, of course, the loss of this dopamine. So, so the loss, lack of dopamine does occur in Parkinson's disease, but it's not, and it causes symptoms, but it's not the cause. The cause is why do these nerve cells tend to malfunction in the first place? And we'll get to that at the end of the talk. Now, myth number six, and this is very prevalent and very misleading, because many of you have read that levodopa stops working after several years. And that is absolutely not true. Levodopa does not stop working. It never stops working. I've had patients that I follow with Parkinson's disease who've been on it for 20 plus years and they're still getting considerable benefit from this. However, there are limitations, including the fact that the levodopa is not, a, the carbidopa levodopa is not a cure. It's, it's, I guess, the analogy again to diabetes. Insulin isn't the cure, it controls the symptoms. Levodopa helps control the symptoms, but it's not curing the disease. It's not preventing nerve cells from continuing to become impaired. And as time goes on, 
Yes, the drug could have side effects. There are what we call dopaminergic side effects. There are also what are called fluctuating symptoms. And there's a lot of symptoms that might not have anything to do with dopamine. So I like to, one way of sort of intuitively figuring out what I'm talking about when I talk about fluctuations, it's I call it the Goldilocks phenomenon in Parkinson's disease. Remember with Goldilocks, the oatmeal couldn't be too hot, it couldn't be too cold, it had to be right. Well, it, when the, to maintain good brain function, the dopamine levels must be not too high, not too low, they must be just right. And early in the course of Parkinson's disease, when you give the carbidopa levodopa, the levels stay pretty steady and they are, if you do the right dosing, the levels are just right. But as time goes on, the nerve cells that produce dopamine are not functioning quite as well. And the levels in the, because the carbidopa levodopa gets in and out of the bloodstream quite quickly, the levels begin to fluctuate and the patient can actually feel it because sometimes if the levels are too low, some of those motor symptoms come back. And if the levels are a little too high or fluctuating, patients can actually get too much movement called dyskinesias. So these are what we call motor fluctuations. Um, and, and, and for those of you who have that, you know, it can be quite upsetting because sometimes you feel, see, I'm really doing well. And an hour later, hey, I'm not moving quite as well. Fortunately, we have all sorts of new approaches some of those medications I mentioned before help reduce motor fluctuations. Usually, if somebody's having these fluctuations, the simplest and most effective way to handle it, of course, is just to readjust the timing of the carbidopa levodopa doses. So if the medicine is wearing off three or four hours after a dose, well, you move the doses closer together, and that often does the trick. Uh, giving higher doses doesn't make it last longer. So it's often the question. So this is why it's really important uh, for people who've had Parkinson's disease for a number of years, they've got to take their medicines on time at the proper dosing intervals. Uh, and it's, it's difficult, but very doable. And it's in some of these patients where the motor fluctuations are significant and not adequately controlled, that's one of the major indications for doing this so-called deep brain stimulation surgery where electrodes are actually put into the brain to modify some of the areas of the brain that actually become overactive when there's a lack of dopamine to sort of create a better balance in this uh, system of motor control in the brain. This has been a major breakthrough. There's also uh, an infusion therapy where, where levodopa can be infused right into the bowel where it's uh, absorbed into the bloodstream to maintain of uh, smoother control. So there, this is a big area of research that's improving the lives of Parkinson's disease patients. But unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, there are networks in the brain that are affected by Parkinson's disease that are not related to dopamine per se. The other parts of the brain can be affected and patients can develop motor symptoms over the years that aren't going to benefit from lack of dopamine because they're not due to lack of dopamine. So this isn't, see, this doesn't mean that the levodopa isn't working. It just means that patients can get symptoms that aren't due to lack of dopamine and including this phenomenon of freezing gait where sometimes people's feet get stuck and can't really move and dopamine helps a bit, but often doesn't really correct that kind of a problem. And certain types of balance problems uh, can be a seen that aren't due to lack of dopamine and problems affecting speech and swallowing also aren't necessarily related to lack of dopamine. So in, in these kinds of situations, here's where a team is necessary, to really adequate control and it could be very helpful, speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and counseling, a very important aspect to get patients functioning in the best possible way and very helpful, all of these uh, will help keep people in the mainstream of life. Now, I always get a call, people get very upset because they read in the paper that so-and-so died of Parkinson's disease. And so myth number seven, Parkinson's disease is a lethal disease. And that is not necessarily the case at all. What is the prognosis? So the World Health Organization recently reported 
that the death rate in Parkinson's disease is the same in those without the condition. One per person. Look, we all do get older, we're all, we're all mortal. But is it gonna be because of the Parkinson's? So here's, here's a, one of my patients asked me, well, Dr. Weiss, how long will I live with this condition? I said, well, you'll, I'm sure you'll make it to at least 85. But I already am 85. See, what did I tell you? Well, it turns out when people ask me the prognosis, it, it, it's really difficult because every case is different. And I, I always tease people, reminding them that only, only the television doctors know the prognosis with certainty. And that's because they have a script. There is no script in life. The, the only thing I can say is, yes, we all do get older. But here's the reality. Turns out the life expectancy for patients with Parkinson's disease who maintain normal cognitive function is not dramatically different from survival rates in the general population. So if I have a 60, let's say a 65 year old man or woman who's developed Parkinson's disease and mentally they're very sharp, I know that they have a very excellent chance of making it to 80. It's just about as good as their next door neighbor who's the same age, but who doesn't have Parkinson's disease. Now, myth number eight, and this is important. People with Parkinson's disease will receive excellent care if they require hospitalization for acute medical or surgical problems. You know, of course, the, one of the good news, of course, is that people really never have to get hospitalized because of Parkinson's itself, but Parkinson, just because you have Parkinson's doesn't mean you can't get uh, heart attack or, or need gallbladder surgery or get hospitalized for some other reason. And the sad reality is though, that often when people with Parkinson's disease are in the hospital, they don't get good care. And here's why. The doctors and nurses who work in hospitals rarely see people with Parkinson's disease because Parkinson's disease per se doesn't cause hospitalization. And they're often unfamiliar with the doses of the Parkinson medications and the fact that certain doses have to be given at certain specific times. So errors are very common. Patients with Parkinson's disease are often given the wrong dose of their carbidopa, levodopa or other medications, or the timing isn't exactly right. And, and, or, and if they're given too much medication that can cause delirium. Uh, and sometimes there are certain medicines that shouldn't be given to people with Parkinson's disease that unfortunately can be administered while people are in the hospital. And, and of course with Parkinson's, it's, it's very easy to become deconditioned and immobile. So people with Parkinson's disease don't do well in the hospital unless they're very proactive. And one thing that's very important for every person with Parkinson's disease is you should be able to name your medications, know the doses and, and tell your doctors or nurses what time you're supposed to get your medications. Now, it, it, which could be a lot to remember. So if certainly every person with Parkinson's just carry a little card, these are my medicines, this is the doses, this is the times, because otherwise you come to the hospital, you're taking the emergency room because you're having chest pain, and they say, what medicines are you taking? I don't know, you know, you better know, you better have that list. You should know your medicines. Bring an accurate list if you have to go to the hospital or have to go to the emergency room. Bring an accurate list, and you know what? actually bring the bottles of your pills to the hospital because, because hospitals seldom see people with Parkinson's disease. You know, if you're on one of the newer medicines, they may not have that medicine in the formulary. I'll say, oh, we'll get it in three days. Well, let me, you bring your medicines with you to the hospital. And you know what? If you're being hospitalized because of a gallbladder or heart or whatever it is, nevertheless, let your neurologist know so that she or he can speak to the doctors in the hospital, just to make sure that you're getting the right medicines, that, that they're not going to mess up to cause some complications that could easily be avoided. Now, myth number nine, Parkinson's disease is a movement disorder. It only affects how people move. Well, I wish that were the case, but it turns out that Parkinson's disease is not just a movement disorder. 
there are other parts of the brain that can become affected. And in many cases, the movements are only the tip of the iceberg. And the symptoms affecting movements are very commonly accompanied by a variety of neuropsychiatric problems, autonomic dysfunction, sleep disorders. What are some of those neuropsychiatric problems? Well, the incidence of depression and anxiety is quite elevated in persons with Parkinson's disease. Um, now, of course, it, it's easy to become depressed if, you know, if you were, let's say, if you're an avid tennis player or golfer and you can't play your favorite sport, uh, that would get you down. But it turns out that the depression we see in Parkinson's disease isn't really what we call a reactive depression. Um, it's what we would call an endogenous depression, where patients uh, may be doing very, very well and yet still have this terrible mood and negative thinking. And sometimes depression actually begins even prior to the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Likewise, anxiety can be very uh, overwhelming. I'd say some of the most difficult patients I've had to treat over the years, it wasn't because of their motor symptoms, it was because of their anxiety. So neuropsychiatric problems, very prevalent, need to be addressed. Once again, sometimes it takes a team. Sometimes we need to get counseling or psychiatry and psychologists involved to help patients cope and manage with these symptoms. Uh, another common neuropsychiatric problem is what we call apathy, the lack of motivation. Uh, people just sort of lose interest. They're not necessarily depressed, but they just don't have that interest. Autonomic dysfunction refers to the part of the nervous system that controls bowel function, blood pressure control. So patients are sometimes susceptible, susceptible to have big swings in their blood pressure where they stand up, the blood pressure gets quite low. A constipation, another big problem. Um, and, and once again, these are these are. Symptoms that can be managed, but it, it, it adds to the complexity. And then sleep disorders are also quite common where patients either uh, can have significant insomnia or sometimes it be too sleepy. So these are all issues that can complicate Parkinson's that can be treated, but they have to be recognized. And, 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 and you know, it's funny because we always focus on the person who has the Parkinson's disease, and sometimes we forget about the, the spouse or the care partner who's trying to help the Parkinson patient and, and what's their health like? Because obviously uh, sometimes it, it can be very stressful to be a care partner. And, and, uh, and obviously the, the care partner has his or her own health issues as well. So um, to really help manage and, and make sure that our patients are doing the best possible, we have to also be concerned about the the well-being of the caregiver or the care partner, because this is a team. It takes a team to treat Parkinson's. It takes a key, it takes a family. It takes a team of doctors, therapists, etc. Now, here's what I think many of you will hopefully find interesting. Myth number ten: little progress has been made in our real understanding of Parkinson's disease, and no cure is in sight. And I think. I don't think that's right. I think we've made some real progress, even though, okay, dopamine is affected, but that's not the cause. I think we're getting close to figuring out what is the cause of Parkinson's disease. Now, it turns out every generation has had its theory of what is the cause of Parkinson's disease. Well, back in the 19th century, Dr. Parkinson's, Dr. Parkinson himself and his the people who followed him really didn't have an idea. They, they thought it was a brain disease of some kind, but they really thought because stress and anxiety and emotions aggravated the symptoms. So for example, if somebody had a tremor, they were more shaky. If they were upset, they thought, well, maybe this really is sort of a nervous disorder. Then again, finally at the beginning of the 20th century, when these little globs called Lewy bodies were discovered, they realized, hey, there actually is something going on in the brain itself. In the 1920s, 
when they had that massive flu pandemic that a uh, hundred years ago, uh, that was followed by an, ep an epidemic of a brain infection called encephalitis. And many of the patients who survived that encephalitis developed sort of symptoms vaguely resembling Parkinson's disease. So that led people to think, well, maybe Parkinson's disease itself is due to an infection. And that was very popular from the 1920s, probably until about 19, the mid 1960s, that maybe Parkinson's disease was somehow an infectious disease. Then, of course, when they discovered the lack of dopamine, said, well, well Parkinson's disease, it's due to lack of dopamine. But that, that missed the point. What was causing the lack of dopamine? And what was causing those cells to deteriorate, the cells that would produce dopamine? And in the 1980s, a very important discovery was made that there were certain toxins that could actually cause Parkinsonian symptoms. In fact, there was a group of uh, addicts and drug addicts in California who literally overnight developed Parkinsonian symptoms because they inadvertently ingested a chemical that was destroying nerve cells in the brain that produced dopamine. So that caused a great research effort to find other toxins in the environment that cause Parkinson's. And that really uh, didn't lead us very far because it turned out that really Parkinson's disease existed uh, well before any of these toxins were ever invented. And um, that didn't seem to account for many cases. And then in the 1990s, genetic research began to show some interesting correlations between certain genetic abnormalities and Carbidopa levodopa. In particular, there was a family uh, of Italian origin in which hundreds of persons in this very, very, very large family had Parkinson's disease. And researchers discovered that this family had a rare genetic quirk in a protein that produced a, in a, in a gene that was coding for a protein known as alpha-synuclein. And everybody has alpha-synuclein in their brain. It's a normal protein, but in this big family of, of, from Italy, they had over 400 people with Parkinson's, there was a mutation in alpha-synuclein, and they discovered that that Lewy body, that little glob that we saw in, in the degenerating cells in the midbrain, was largely composed of alpha-synuclein. Now, very few, very mutations in alpha synuclein are very rare. So, if I had a uh, hundred patients with Parkinson's disease, only in about maybe three or four of out of a hundred would there actually be a, a really bona fide genetic abnormality, such as this alpha synuclein uh, abnormality. So, so in the ninety-five or more percent of patients with Parkinson's, there is no one genetic trigger. But we've learned that there are numerous genes that increase the risk of Parkinson's disease. Um, they've identified little, literally 90 different genes where a little quirk in the genes may increase your risk of getting Parkinson's. For example, if you live to 70, age 70, by age 70, two or 3% of people might have Parkinson's, but some of these genetic minor genetic abnormalities that risk maybe, let's say, 5% instead of 2%. So it doesn't really cause Parkinson's, but it creates a risk. So now we're in the 21st century, and there's really a confluence of genetic, toxic, as well as age-related factors that seem to trigger perhaps some misfolding of proteins that leads to Parkinson's disease. Now, let me just backtrack. Another important discovery in the last 20 years or so has been the fact that we realize that the first symptom of Parkinson's disease, the first symptoms are not motor symptoms. Now, patients often come to the doctor if they develop a tremor, or maybe if their walking is slowed down, or their handwriting has gotten a little smaller. But indeed, there's a group of symptoms that suggest Parkinson's that probably began five or 10 or more years before that including something called REM sleep behavioral disorder, a, a, a peculiar condition where REM sleep is that phase of sleep where you're 
dreaming, and REM stands for rapid eye movements, because when people are dreaming, their eyes are closed, but the eyes, the eyes are actually moving. That's, that's, that's what you normally do when you're sleeping, but your body's normally still. But with REM sleep behavior disorder, if people are having a very active dream, this inhibition of movement during dream phase of sleep, which normally occurs, doesn't occur. And it turns out that the vast majority of persons who have this very abnormal dream enactment behavior, if you follow them over the next 10 or five or 10 or so years, the vast majority will actually develop Parkinson's. So the first symptom of Parkinson's disease might actually be REM sleep behavior disorder. Likewise, loss of sense of smell often precedes the motor symptoms by a number of years, as does changes in bowel and some other rather esoteric things. So we research realizes that, hey, the tremor or the slowing of movements isn't the first symptom of Parkinson's disease. It might be REM sleep behavior disorder. So this led to this theory that maybe this misfolded protein that causes Lewy bodies in the midbrain might be misfolding in other parts of the nervous system outside of the brain even years before it reaches the brain. So this, this whole theory that maybe there's some type of cascade of misfolding proteins that's evolving over decades that actually causes Parkinson's disease. And sometimes it's triggered by genetic factors. Sometimes it might be triggered by exposures to the in environment or even chemicals that the body itself is producing. And age is clearly a factor because look, we don't see Parkinson's disease in teenagers or 20 year old patients. When we see Parkinson's in let's say a very young patient like Michael J. Fox, it's almost always one of those rare genetic forms. Um, so this whole confluence is leading to some new ideas about what's causing Parkinson's disease. And we now realize, okay, if we could somehow stop this spread of these misfolding proteins that are possibly damaging nerve cells, and maybe we could slow down Parkinson's disease, and maybe we could even eventually prevent it. So I think uh, for those of you who are frustrated, this type of research, of course, takes tremendous amount of effort and work, and, and, and sadly, it, it doesn't occur overnight. But I really think that some of the major research labs around the country are really onto something that may revolutionize the way we treat Parkinson's because we might be on the cusp of discovering ways to slow down the progression of Parkinson's disease and maybe even eventually prevent it. Well, what can you do in the meantime? Well, there's a lot. Exercise regularly, lead a healthy lifestyle, eat healthy, take good care of yourself. If you're, you know, once again, effort isn't always rewarded, but lack of effort is never rewarded. Lead a healthy lifestyle, get one of those exercise classes. If you're on medication, take your medications reliably. Stay in close contact with your physician, with your neurologist and your other physicians um, to monitor how you're doing with these medications. It's so important to maintain good mental health. And if you are suffering with anxiety, if you are suffering with depression, these are difficult, but they're treatable. If you need, many patients need to talk to a therapist, or even maybe get some medication from a psychiatrist. But good mental health makes all the difference in the world. Stay in the mainstream of life. Don't stop going out to dinner with your friends. Don't stop going to the theater or the symphony. Socialize. So important. Stay in the mainstream of life. And then, of course, if you're able to support Parkinson's disease research programs, there are some wonderful opportunities, uh, obviously, supporting organizations like MAPS is very important and supporting some of the organizations such as the Michael J. Fox Foundation that support research are really, really critical. 
because I am optimistic that in the near future, we will knock out Parkinson's disease. So, well, thank you very much. And uh, I hope this information was helpful. Um, we actually, before the, uh, the session, and many of you submitted questions, and we've got several patients, several, uh, several page, pages of questions that I really, uh, I can't possibly answer all of them, but I, I looked through these questions and I, I think I answered many of them during this talk, but there were a couple that, that weren't addressed. Um, and Judy, is it okay if I answer some of these questions? Because there were several people asked. You're on mute. Yeah. You're on mute, Judy. Yeah. yeah. It, several, several people, oops, several people had asked me about swallowing problems of Parkinson's disease, and and they were worried: is this lead to pneumonia? And and, and um, so I just thought it's something that I would just touch on, since several people had asked about the swallowing, because remember I mentioned just briefly in passing that this trouble with swallowing is one of those symptoms that might occur, but it isn't necessarily lack due to lack of dopamine, so that sometimes jiggling the carbidopa, levodopa, or our other medicines doesn't really make swallowing problems resolve. Um, and and the, the issue, of course, here is that swallowing is a very complicated activity. Several muscles have to relax and contract in exact synchrony in order for the things to go down the right way. And so often the initial symptom of trouble swallowing is people are, let's, let's say, drinking something and they're coughing after they drink or eat. <coughs> and I have so many patients, they go end up seeing an ENT doctor or somebody uh, because, oh, I've got a cough. And what's really happening is that they're just little bits of fluid or food are actually going, instead of going down the food pipe, are going down into the trachea, into the lungs, so that, um, that this is a common symptom. And I think if you're having any type of coughing or choking when you're eating or drinking, uh, and, or in, in particular, if, and if, if you feel that maybe you're having a little trouble with your speech, it's always important to get evaluated by a speech therapist. These are the people who specialize in speech and swallowing disturbances. And, and some of the tips that this, the speech therapist often gives patients is number one, uh, and I always tell patients, whatever you do, don't eat too fast. Don't try to keep up with everyone else at dinner. If you're having any issues with swallowing, take your time, be the last one done. Slow bites, be cautious. It turns out that liquids, oops, liquids require more, um, coordination for swallowing than things like mashed potatoes or solids. Solids tend to go down in a lump, whereas the liquids sort of go all over the place and, and are more likely to go into the trachea. So drink sips of fluid slowly and thickening, adding, drinking thickened liquids often helps. Um, so there's, but there's a whole host of things, you know, because I know a couple, I have a couple of questions because I guess they read in the newspaper that so and so had Parkinson's and died of pneumonia and aspiration. And it's true that if enough goes down into the lungs, you can get pneumonia, and that could be very, very serious. And it's very preventable. So, certainly, if you're having speech and swallowing problems, a speech therapist can give you some great advice with that. Then I had another question about shortness of breath in Parkinson's. This is something that seldom gets discussed. Uh, in a regular talk, it turns out Parkinson's does not actually have a, a significant effect on the lungs or the heart per se, but of course, heart disease and lung disease can cause shortness of breath. So if somebody with Parkinson's disease is having shortness of breath, I think the first thing we would want to do would be to make sure uh, that there's no cardiac problem or pulmonary problems if there's not Seema, congestive heart failure, things that have nothing to do with Parkinson's disease. What, and, and, and shortness of breath certainly isn't that common due to Parkinson's, but occasionally it is related to Parkinson's. As I mentioned before, anxiety can be a very overwhelming symptom for some Parkinson patients. 
Um, anxiety aggravates tremors. It aggravates dyskinesias. It aggravates everything in life. And often when people are having episodes of anxiety, they become very short of breath. And, and patients who have these motor fluctuations where they're doing well for much of the day and then suddenly find they're not moving well, that also can create anxiety and, and that sense of shortness of breath. Very rarely people can have what are called dyskinesias of the respiratory muscles that make them feel short of breath. Certain patients who have very low blood pressure when they stand up, what we call orthostatic hypotension, that also can create a sense of short of breath. And clearly if somebody's choking or aspirating, that can cause shortness of breath. So there's a whole host of things. It's not a common symptom in Parkinson's, but it is something that can be distressing. Now, I also had several questions about deep brain stimulation surgery. Who should be getting deep brain stimulation surgery? And fortunately, most patients with Parkinson's don't need deep brain stimulation surgery, but for some patients and for many patients, it can be a great benefit. So I should have made some extra slides on this, but how does it work? As you see in this little picture, it's sort of like a heart pacemaker. The wires go below the skin, but instead of the electrodes going into the heart, they actually go into a little area of the brain. And as I alluded to earlier, in Parkinson's disease, some areas of the brain become underactive because of the lack of dopamine and other chemicals, but other areas of the brain actually become a little overactive. In the brain, there's what we call both um, excitation and inhibition. And if, if there's a loss of inhibition, then things get a little too excitable. So this electrode is put in a very specific area of the brain by a skilled neurosurgeon using computerized techniques. It's actually, it's a lengthy, but not a painful operation. You're not in the hospital for more than a day. And the electrical discharges can be adjusted uh, by the neurologist to sort of dampen areas of the brain that might be somewhat overactive. And this is a very effective way of helping to reduce these so-called off spells. So the major reason for doing deep brain stimulation is for somebody who has this on and off cycling. And if the medications by mouth aren't providing adequate control, uh, these fluctuating symptoms can be controlled. So the, the ideal candidate would be somebody who has typical Parkinson's disease and, and someone who doesn't have significant psychiatric or cognitive issues, somebody who's in basically good health and somebody who's having a good response to levodopa. This surgery doesn't, it, it sort of enhances the effect of the levodopa. It, sadly, it doesn't help those motor symptoms that don't respond to levodopa. So for example, it doesn't help swallowing. It doesn't help some of those balance problems that are not due to lack of dopamine. But it's particularly helpful for these off, preventing these off spells. Um, and it's also very helpful. Some patients, and this isn't very common, but some Parkinson patients really have pretty horrible tremors. And this, and, and sometimes those tremors don't respond to medication very well. So for people with really bad tremors, also quite helpful. Now on the same line, I got a couple questions about a new treatment that's being used at the University of Maryland for treating Parkinson's, particularly for treating tremor. And that's called MRI guided focused ultrasound. So what's that all about? So just as I mentioned with the DBS, this electrode is put in a little part of the brain. It sort of puts areas of the brain that are overactive. It sort of puts them to sleep without actually damaging the brain. Um, and, and it could be adjusted and tweaked remotely. The MRI guided ultrasound does not require invasive surgery. There's no electrode being put into the brain. There's no little pacemaker device being placed. What is done is the patient is put into a what's a stereotactic frame. It's like your head is put in one place so you can't move. And they focus thousands of ultrasound beams on an area called the thalamus, which is one of these little relay stations 
that becomes a little overactive in persons with tremor. And by focusing thousands of ultrasound beams on this one little point in the brain, it increases the temperature of the tissue. And they can make the temperature high enough that they actually can obliterate this little area of the brain. And this turns out to be very helpful for treating tremor. It's not helpful for treating other Parkinson's symptoms in general, but they're, they're doing some research. It's, so it, it is surgical in the sense that they're actually putting a little hole in the brain. Um, it's, it's new. I think it's still, it's, it's not experimental. Um, I think it's, its major use would be for people who have just a very, very severe tremor, which fortunately in Parkinson's disease, usually tremor isn't the most significant symptom, but this is, this is a valid new treatment. Now, um, then I had several questions really concerned about life and death issues. And, uh, you know, and, and I tried to address that. I mean, the Parkinson's is something you have to live with. You know, people, sadly, right now we can't get rid of it. So if, if you have it, you have to live with it, but it's a life sentence, not a death sentence. But the, cause, the quality of life in people with Parkinson's really often depends as much on the patient's mental health and attitude as, as, as whether the motor symptoms are, are more or less severe. And I think that's, that's, that can't be underestimated, un underemphasized. And I think sometimes we sort of neglect that and just focus on, on things like tremor or, and, and not pay enough attention as doctors to the patient's emotional health and, 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 and things that uh, have a huge impact on quality of life. Now I had maybe time, time one last question. Um, I had a couple of questions regarding dizziness in Parkinson's disease. And this is a common problem um, that many people with Parkinson's disease will have fluctuating blood pressure. So they may be sitting in a, you may be sitting in a chair and your blood pressure is nice and normal. And then when you get up, you stand up, in some patients, the blood pressure can drop to extraordinarily low levels. And that gives this sense of lightheadedness and giddiness and weakness. And, and sometimes even could lead to fainting if the pressure drops very low. And that's because of malfunction in that, what we call the autonomic nervous system, the part of the nervous system that regulates blood pressure. And sometimes the blood pressure goes up and down like a yo-yo effect. I often tease patients that the blood pressure can be like the Dow Jones industrial average. You can go up and it could go down. And if, and if it goes down too low, you can get very dizzy and, and weak. Um, and there are, you know, it, if that's a problem, the one issue that always comes up is that that is particularly significant in people who are not drinking enough fluid. And dehydration is very common. A lot of my patients are not drinking enough water. So what, if you are experiencing these episodes of low blood pressure and giddiness when you stand up, by all means, be sure you're drinking enough water. Uh, and, and there are other things, you know, and, and often uh, that makes a world of difference, staying well hydrated. And often medicines have to be adjusted because a lot of the medicines we take can cause the blood pressure to drop. Um, and in, in some cases, patients have to be put on medication to raise their blood pressure. So it's another one of those symptoms that can be managed, but it has to be diagnosed. And I always recommend that, you know, when you go to the doctor, they should always be checking your blood pressure, not only seated, but also when you're on your feet, because there may be a 50 point difference uh, the pressure might be quite low. And of course, unless you're checking it, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to diagnose that. Well, um, then I had a question about what is my opinion about alternative medications in Parkinson's disease? And maybe one, I'll make this the last question for tonight. Um, so of course, if, you know, a, a, the term alternative medicine sort of implies something that 
hasn't really been studied or evaluated or tested because if it, if, it, if it withstood rigorous testing, we wouldn't consider it alternative. <laughs> but and of course, if an alternative works, that, that means that it must have an effect. It must, it must be affecting something. And, and if it has an effect, that means it might have a beneficial effect and it might also have a side effect. So just because something is FDA approved, we all know that all the FDA approved medications are studied because everything has benefits and might have some side effects and you have to weigh the two. So if, if the medicine is actually effective, to think that it would have benefits and no side effects is, is sort of wishful thinking. So I'm, I have many patients who take alternative medications and I think many of them are safe, but probably expensive placebos. So I, I don't have a, an, an opinion. I certainly can't recommend it because if it's untried and, and untested, you know, may, maybe yes, maybe no, but so many things have been proposed over the years that have been of no benefit that I, I'd rather, I don't come out on the side of encouraging people to try these things because some of them may not turn out to be as safe as you think. In any event, it was a fun talking to all you folks tonight. And I hope uh, this was informative. And uh, Judy, anything, uh, any comments? Howard, that, that was so interesting and so wonderful. I think Dawn maybe has a few questions that haven't been addressed. Good, good. Um, I could listen to you all night, though. <laughs> um, I do want to mention someone did make a comment that the information you shared, um, I'll, 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 I'll quote it exactly. She said her husband who has advanced PD has proven Dr. Weiss's point about quality of life. After Dr. Weiss asked him how he was feeling, her husband suddenly decided he was feeling very differently than he had been that instead of focusing on wanting to die, he is going to focus on the people he loves and who love him. Oh, isn't that nice? Isn't yes, that nice? I, I totally agree. Um, this one person said they damaged their knees in karate 30 years ago. Off and on for the past 30 years, they've received relief from chiropractor. Mm -hmm. Now two years, into Parkinson's, I have the feeling my upper knee is scraping my lower knee, excruciating pain. I was told a chiropractor would be, would now be useless, but it is a nerve pain, not structural. Is that true? I ha I'll have to pass on that one. That's, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to know. There's so many things that might be playing a role you know, with, with knee pain. I mean, so, you know, but, but just as a general point, um, look, a lot of us, you know, we're all getting a little older and, and of course, um, having Parkinson's doesn't prevent somebody from getting arthritis. And, and one of the challenges sometimes is when I have a patient with Parkinson's who's having, I'd say a lot of shoulder pain or knee pain or hip pain, um, is it, is it related to Parkinson's disease or is it just arthritic or, or nerve pain or something totally unrelated? Because um, you know, it's, sometimes Parkinson's disease, particularly if there's a lot of stiffness, it can be painful. But you know, what you described doesn't sound like something I would expect from the Parkinson's disease. And, and of course, uh, somebody with chronic knee pain uh, for, for other reasons, you know, I think they're just gonna have to see a good knee specialist, not, uh, that it, that, not necessarily a Parkinson's specialist about that, about that symptom. All right, I have another question. I seem to have uncontrolled movements at night after dinner in two glasses of wine. What can I do to stop these? So um, just as a general question, what about alcohol and Parkinson's? So of course, obviously in moderation, I, I don't see any reason why somebody with Parkinson's disease can't have a glass of wine or a little alcoholic drink. Of course, I don't want people driving a car or doing the usual things. So, so but I, I don't think alcohol per se is contraindicated in Parkinson's disease. In fact, for some patients, 
um, you know, the relaxing effects of alcohol can be very therapeutic. Now, if this person is getting a lot of involuntary movements in the evening, you know, one thing I would think of is, well, is the patient really having this kinesias? And sometimes at the end of the day, when people have been taking multiple doses of Parkinson's medication with the carbidopa levodopa, sometimes it can build up at the end of the day and people can get a lot of dyskinesias. So um, yet over the years, I'll often get phone calls from patients, uh, often from the spouse that the person's having a lot of involuntary movements. And it's always hard to know, is it dyskinesia, which might mean too much medication or tremor, which might mean maybe they need a little more medication. So without actually seeing what these involuntary movements look like, you can't be sure. So what I would often tell patients um, is look, if you're having some involuntary movements at a certain time of the day, take your smartphone, make a little 20 second video of it and then text it to me. You know, you know, and that's a good thing. Some of you, uh, some, some of the, people with Parkinson's disease in the audience, if you're having some involuntary movements or some unusual symptom like that, um, it, it probably makes sense to take a little video of it so that you can maybe the next time you see your doctor, you can actually show her or him what it looks like. Because sometimes it's not sure, is it dyskinesia or like Michael J. Fox where he can't sit still or is it actually a tremor? And, or is it dystonia, which is another kind of involuntary movement. So, so it's hard, you know, without actually seeing the movement, it's hard to know what it might be. It, I, I don't think the alcohol itself would be the culprit. Um, I mean, I, you know, I don't think alcohol doesn't induce abnormal movements in people with Parkinson's disease. Um, but sometimes the accumulation of medication can, and, and certainly stress. Boy, stress triggers tremors, Stress triggers dyskinesias. Stress can trigger these off spells. That's, that's why managing anxiety and stress becomes so important. Um, I have another question. Can you please talk about treating PD-related constipation and why it happens in the first place? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. So it turns out the colon has millions of little nerve cells in the colon itself. And these are semi-automatic because, you know, the, the bowel has its own, doesn't have its own brain, but it has its own rhythmicity that these nerve cells help stimulate colonic contractions. And it turns out, that, remember I mentioned that some of these Lewy body changes might actually occur outside of the nervous system before people actually have the motor symptoms. And, and you can actually see some of this so-called Lewy pathology affecting the nerve cells in the colon in some patients. So, so there's definitely a potential for some neurological impairment of colonic contractility. And then that's often accompanied by the fact that maybe patients aren't drinking enough. There may be an element of dehydration uh, and, and, and inactivity also can impair colonic function. And of course, in dietary changes can affect colonic. So often there's a combination of neurological problems in the colon itself, plus diet, plus lack of activity. And then some patients just don't have that ability to uh, strain as well because of the Parkinson's. So typically what, what the simplest things to recommend, of course, is make sure you're not dehydrated, you're drinking enough. Certainly increase the fiber content in the diet. Um, those of you who've had Parkinson's for a number of years probably remember Becky Dunlop, the nurse at Hopkins who had the whole special formula for treating constipation with bran and some prunes. He had a whole little formula, but I think having extra prunes and raisins and bran fiber uh, plus extra fluid is often very helpful. And then, and then it's sadly, some patients need to do a little more and things like uh, polyethylene glycol or Miralax often helps. But, you, you know, I think a common theme that I don't want to sound like a broken record, but make sure you're drinking enough water because dehydration is a factor. 
It's, but for, for many patients, constipation is just a horrible symptom. You know? All right, thank you, Dr. Weiss. Um, I have one more. My husband leans to the left. Is that going to affect his back in time? Very, this is, this, is a, this is a phenomenon that occurs in, you know, maybe 10 or 20% of Parkinson patients because, you know, in the, in the book, some patients lean to the left, some might lean to the right. And it has to do with the fact that Parkinson's disease itself, is, as many of you know, is, can be very asymmetric. For example, people who have a tremor often find that it's much worse, let's say, in one hand than the other. Uh, it might be worse in the right hand or it might be worse in the left hand, or, or, so if the, or the stiffness or rigidity is worse on one side than the other. So Parkinson's is often asymmetric. So if some of those muscles adjacent to the spine are also asymmetrically being more rigid on one side than the other, patients often might tilt a little bit to the side. In fact, they actually call this the PISA syndrome in honor of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. <laughs> but thank goodness the Leaning Tower of Pisa has not fallen. <laughs> so so this, is, this is common. And this is one of these funny, when I see patients who have this tilted spine, generally, you know, you, we always try to optimize the medicines with the carbidopoly bilopa, but often that doesn't do the trick. So I would say this probably falls into the category of something that's not strictly dopaminergic. So it doesn't, it, it's seldom, I mean, I, I, over the years, I, I, it seldom leads to spinal damage, you know, spinal cord damage. Sometimes it could be painful, uh, uncom uncomfortable. Um, more often than not, it's, it's cos more cosmetic than disabling, let's put it that way. Um, one, one thing we didn't talk about was false and balance, but that could be a whole separate lecture. But usually the people who have this piece of syndrome aren't necessarily more susceptible to falls. There's other factors that generally might predispose to falling. Okay, I think it's quarter after eight. And Dr. Weiss, thank you so, so much, uh, really. Um, it was, it was wonderful. And Dawn, do you have some closing comments? I do. Um, on behalf of MAPS, um, I wanna thank our fantastic speaker, Dr. Weiss. You delivered so much good information and today's sponsors as well, Synovian, Amnil, MedStar Health and the Parkinson's Foundation. And of course, a very special thank you to each and of every one of you who joined us today. Um, after this ends, we have one more assignment for you. Don't forget to fill out the evaluations and please mark your calendars for Sunday, May 15th for the MAPS Living with Parkinson's Symposium 2022. It will be held at the Edward Meyerberg Center from 12 to 3.30 and it will be live and in person. You will be able to register online during the first week in April and look forward and look for more information in weekly newsletters. Um, thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.